China's rapid technological development, not only in artificial intelligence, but also in other strategic sectors like batteries and nuclear power and renewable energy and new energy vehicles, electric vehicles. This is all very important in several key ways that I'll be talking about today because it challenges one of the fundamental elements of Western hegemony and of imperialism, which has been based on a global division of labor in which the wealthy advanced economies in the core of the world system historically have produced the high value added products that they exported to the formerly colonized countries in the periphery of the system that exported primary commodities, you know, raw materials and such, and imported the advanced manufactured goods. China has completely disrupted that system. And AI is actually a great example of this. In the United States, big tech corporations concentrated in Silicon Valley have been spending hundreds of billions of dollars every year on capital expenditure for AI development. And this includes big companies like OpenAI, which is half owned by Microsoft, one of the most powerful corporate monopolies on earth. And this big investment boom in AI has also been driving a huge part of the growth in the stock market in the US, given that these big tech companies known as the Magnificent Seven dominate about one third of the S&P 500 and are very overrepresented in the global stock market index of the MSCI. So China is essentially popping a massive bubble in the equity market. And this company, DeepSeek, produced an artificial intelligence model, R1, with $6 million, comparing that to the hundreds of billions being spent every year by US big tech companies. And this model was made open source, which is so important because many formerly colonized developing countries were told essentially that they were not going to be able to get access to AI or to develop it themselves. And even the billionaire CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, was asked about this in a press conference and he encouraged people in India not to try to develop AI themselves because he argued that they would not be able to compete with the massive big tech corporations in Silicon Valley because of obviously they don't have hundreds of billions of dollars to invest. What China has shown is you don't necessarily need hundreds of billions of dollars to flood into capital expenditure to develop this technology. And by making its models open source, DeepSeek is also taking away some of the monopoly power that these Western companies, US companies that is, wanted to use as their business model. You know, the business model in Silicon Valley is to operate at a loss until you can establish a monopoly. And then once you've destroyed all competitors, charge monopoly rents. This is what Uber did. This is what Meta and social media companies in the US did. And this is what OpenAI was hoping to do. But now that there is international competition and it is open source, which is a huge blow to their attempt to extract monopoly rents. And this was in fact once admitted openly by the billionaire oligarch Peter Thiel, who's very far right, and he has funded the campaigns of Donald Trump and the campaigns of other far right Republicans. In fact, the vice president, J.D. Vance, previously worked for Peter Thiel. And back in 2014, Thiel published an article in the Wall Street J Journal titled Competition is for Losers. And he argued that Silicon Valley firms should look to build a monopoly. And he pointed out that most of the successful Silicon Valley companies like Google are monopolies and they use their market power to become very profitable through the extraction of monopoly rent. This is why I think The Guardian was correct when they referred to DeepSeek as, quote, the biggest threat to Silicon Valley's hegemony, end quote. The biggest threat is actually having competition because one of the goals of U.S. imperialism has been to destroy all international competition to U.S. monopoly capital. And the stated policy of the United States is to try to stop China from technologically developing. This was admitted openly by the Biden administration's Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo. She said that the U.S. wanted to, quote, slow down China's rate of innovation, end quote. So what happened? The first Trump administration imposed tariffs and sanctions on Chinese tech companies like Huawei. The Biden administration came in and continued those policies, expanding tariffs, especially targeting Chinese industries that have become very important 
They're known as the three new industries, which include electric vehicles, solar panels, and batteries, which were all targeted by the Biden administration with tariffs, as, as well as semiconductors. And of course, this has been referred to as a chip war that the United States is waging, trying to prevent China from getting access to cutting edge NVIDIA chips, which it assumed were needed to develop high tech AI technology. But we now know that China has been able to get around these restrictions so what is the response of the Trump administration? Well, it's just doubling down on what Biden did, which is saying, OK, China was able to get around these restrictions. So we need to make the restrictions even tougher. We need to expand the export restrictions, not only in China, but on neighboring countries like Singapore. And we need to dub all of this Chinese technology a so-called national security threat in order to justify banning it. So just as any time there's a Chinese competitor to a U.S. tech monopoly, the U.S. claims, OK, this is a national security threat. We must ban it like TikTok. That's what they did to TikTok, which is owned by the Chinese parent company ByteDance. And so then what ironically, a lot of people in the U.S. moved over to another Chinese app called Xiao Hongshu, which ironically means Little Red Book. It's often translated as Red Note. So then the U.S. government said, well, Red Note's also a national security threat and Deep Seek's a national security threat. Any actual competition to U.S. monopoly capital is a national security threat and the state must ban that competition to protect u.s monopolists and of course it's no surprise that these big tech corporations fund u.s politicians from both parties and trump invited the ceos of all these big tech companies to his inauguration which was the perfect symbol of the u.s oligarchy and how of how the capitalist class is helping to create u.s government policy on behalf of its own economic interests I mean, the fact that Elon Musk, the world's richest capitalist, is now effectively the de facto unelected co-president is a clear sign of that. So one of the points that I'm trying to emphasize here is that imperialism tries to maintain, try to reify a global division of labor in which the advanced capitalist countries are at the top of the industrial pyramid and produce high value added commodities and formerly colonized developing countries in the global south in the, the periphery are trapped in producing low value added commodities and primary commodities which are exported to the core. This was the system identified by the dependency theorists in the mid 20th century. But what happened is toward the end of the 20th century, the creation of new technologies, digital technologies and the internet and such led to an increase in the mobility of capital. It became much easier for capital to move all around the world. So the imperialist countries in the core they began to deindustrialize, primarily the United States, along with the UK. And although previously they had been major industrial powers, especially the US after World War II destroyed its industrial competitors, by the neoliberal era, the US began to offshore and to deindustrialize and financialize the economy. And the idea was that other countries in the periphery would simply produce the low value added products for US companies concentrated in the imperial core and the intellectual property monopolies of those company, that value, that those mega profits would go to the West, to the United States in particular, because it was in the comparative advantage, as they argued, of the US to become the banker and the financier of the world. And then China, countries like China and countries in the global South, Indonesia, Vietnam, countries in Latin America would become the workshop of the world. So when the United States normalized relations with China and when the US allowed China to become part of the World Trade Organization in 2001, the idea was that the US would offshore its low value added labor intensive production and China would perpetually be trapped at the bottom of the pyramid, that the intellectual property monopolies would be in the US. So US companies like Apple would design the products and then workers in China would create, would actually manufacture the goods, but the vast majority of the profit would actually go to the intellectual property holders in the core. China did not want to be trapped at the bottom of the pyramid. China wanted to industrialize and produce its own manufactured goods through its own firms and through a state-led industrialization campaign using robust industrial policy and joint ventures and state-owned enterprises and state-owned finance directed through window guidance to very important strategic industries through the state-owned banks in China and through state investment and in infrastructure, 
China's socialist market economy model was able to oversee some of the fastest industrial development in history, the fastest industrial development. And China was able to move above, move up the international industrial structure from labor intensive, low value added commodities to the high tech industries we see today. So the U.S., when the U.S. allowed China to join the WTO, the idea was that China would perpetually make toasters and textiles and toys for the United States. But China didn't want to be subservient. And this is one of the main issues. This is at the root of the U.S. new Cold War being waged against China. It is a war to maintain monopoly capital, which in the neoliberal era has been the way that the U.S. has been able to maintain its economic dominance despite deindustrializing. And if you don't believe me, well, don't just take my word for it. I'm going to conclude this analysis today with an article that was written by the CEO of the U.S. AI company Anthropic, which after OpenAI is probably the most important U.S. AI company. And Anthropic is partially owned by Google and Amazon. They're major investors. And the CEO of Anthropic is named Dario Amode. And he published an article in January on his website in which he called for Trump to impose even stronger U.S. export controls on China. And he said, the question is whether China will be able to get millions of chips. And he warned, if China can get those chips, we will live in a bipolar world where both the U.S. and China have powerful AI models. However, if the U.S. can restrict China's technological development, by blocking its access to semiconductors, to chips. Then he wrote, quote, if China can't get millions of chips, we'll at least temporarily live in a unipolar world where only the U.S. and its allies have these models, end quote. And then he added, quote, in this world, the U.S. and its allies might take a commanding and long-lasting lead on the global stage. Well-enforced export controls are the only thing that can prevent China from getting millions of chips and are therefore the most important determinant of whether we end up in a unipolar or bipolar world, end quote. So this is the explicitly stated goal of the U.S. capitalist class, to maintain a global monopoly in a unipolar world to prevent China from challenging U.S. monopoly capital. There is so much more that I could say, but I know that I was supposed to keep this analysis very short today, so I want to thank everyone. I am Ben Norton of Geopolitical Economy Report. It's been a pleasure.